Uh, today is September 20th, 2021, and this is the work session for the Salisbury City Council. Uh, we have a fairly lengthy agenda with a lot of items on it today, so we're going to try to get through everything as uh, thorough and quickly as possible. So first item on the agenda is a 2020 census update. So we have Dr. Monte DeShiel and Dr. Sonia, and Sonia Whited from the Census Count Committee. Both were co-chairs. So uh, please come up to the podium. I believe we have a presentation. Yep. Or, oh, yeah. They it's already up there. there. Thank you. I guess Kim will have one for Jack as yes. well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Billy. I was going to say good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sonia Whited. Hi, I'm Dr. Bronte DeShield. Yes, and we were co-chairs of the um, City of Salisbury, Wicomico County um, Complete Count Committee for the, the census. And what we're going to review, it's not anything with redistricting, it's reviewing um, our kind of our transition report, our recommendations from, we did a lot of work for the, the um, CCC, that's what the Complete Count Committee initials are in case I c continue to use those. And we just wanted to review some, some things. We're not going to go through that thick document that you have in front of you that have all the attachments and the pre <laughs> I know you were wishing that we would, but um, it has what it is, it's, it's so thick because of it has all the presentations and the town halls and some of those things that we've done for you to be able to see. And also it's the transition report for the 2030 census to give a blueprint for that. So I think Dr. Shiel, you're gonna start. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I also want to mention that our two chairs was our wonderful Julia Glantz and Lori Carter, um, who were very supportive and very much leading the collaboration between the city and the county on this project, which was very important for its success. Um, some of the things that we recommend for our success for the next time that we do this, and one of our priorities was to do what you have in your hands, is to create a framework, which is something we did not have in the beginning. So we kind of really, really um, brainstorm a lot together um, to figure out what we were gonna do to move forward and then making sure we documented that. So in 10 years from now, or actually seven years from now, you'll be able to start with something as opposed to nothing and build from there, hopefully to get to our 100% that we wanted this time. Um, our recommendations, um, the first was about funding sources, which was a big challenge for us. Um, there was about a $4.7 million grant that went out to the state of Maryland. Unfortunately, the Eastern Shore was not <laughs> part of that process, we found it a little late. So once we presented that to the state, um, Sonia and I presented and kind of was a little frustrated, but they did give us a $20,000 um, lot allotment of money. And anyone who's done a campaign before know that that's not a lot, it doesn't go very far. Um, but we were creative and, and we had a lot of people anonymously donate money to, as well and collaborate with other entities in our town. So it's good to keep in mind that we know this is coming, start planning for it now, start stashing $5 a week or something to put it to the side so we can be ready to hit the ground running. Um, and again, it's a collaborative effort between the city and the county. The funding sources should reflect that as well. Um, early engagement, so we did uh, several processes, but it's very important to get everyone geared up and ready to go before we do boots on the ground. We went through lots of training. Um, brainstorming, identifying members that were on this um, before, 10 years prior to, really getting some oral history from them of how things went and some recommendations that they might have. Um, in addition to, <clears throat> excuse me, recommendations, Wacomico and City of Salisbury partnership, accountable personnel from each government is critical. So once again, that collaborative efforts is so important um, and not just in the complete count committee, but also the head. So the mayor and the county executor showing that synergy that's positive and collaborative really, really gave us great momentum to start with. Um, and so we wanna make sure we hold on to that and keep that synergy going to be successful. 
strong engagement, public relations, media, social media. We're very engaged, thanks to Sonia, in so <laughs> media, social media, which we weren't really a part of until she came along. And it, you know, then it got contagious to Lori, and then it got extra <laughs> contagious, and we got Jesse. So I think we almost had our own, we had a census road show going, um, Facebook Live, lots of pictures, lots of archives, just to show that it was a lot of work, but it also was enjoyable to be blessed with such a great team to work with. Um, participation <clears throat> and establishing events during the census response timing, tie-in to already established community events. So if United Way was doing something or Tri-County was doing something, we wanted to collaborate with them and kind of jump on the bandwagon together and do it collaboratively, which was great, again, supporting the synergy of this effort. Um, making sure that the community overall, that we are showing up at events, um, that our, everyone knows who we are. I've even gotten introduced as a census lady. So <laughs> <laughs> um, people know who we are and people were really excited about it and it was just great to be a part of a, a great team. Um, Sonia's gonna go on to share with you lessons learned. Yes. Thank you. Um, so. Um, Bronze had covered a lot of things, but we just wanted to emphasize some of the, the lessons learned, some things that we would want to start in um, like 2027. And we're not going to keep saying 2030 because starting early is, is really, really key. So um, we had two active subcommittees, so one for the nonprofit organizations, and that committee was very important with the education phase. So not necessarily the implementation and at March 15th um, where we started with implementing the census, but people needed to know what that was. And so I know United Way, Community Foundation, a bunch of people did the education phase just to talk about the census. That's really very, very important. Also part of um, another active subcommittee was the faith-based one and so getting our churches involved and making sure that um, all of our um, constituents un understand the importance of their response for the census it only takes well um, what was our phrase it was 10 minutes 10 questions and ten years. for 10 years, years. Yes. thank you yes. thank you um, <laughs> and so it, it doesn't take a lot of time but it's so 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 important um, as, as Bronte stated our events even despite you know, the last, what has been going on the last 20 months has been very, very um, successful. So we talked about the early education piece and Bronte, Bronte also hit on the Census Roadshow. And so aside from the fact that it was my outlet during the pandemic, so I enjoyed it thoroughly, <laughs> was the fact that it actually was um, something that Jesse and Lori um, definitely spearheaded and Julia was a, a big part of it as well in terms of just working with the Department of Planning, working with some of the organizations. You mentioned United Way, a very, very key one though, a very, very key partnership was the Lower Shore Vulnerable mm -hmm. Population. Yeah. They always had a table for us. We always had a, a good sign up there and it, and it worked out really, really well. So uh, the, the collaboration and working on events that already exist is really, really um, key. If you can wanna hit the next one for me, thank you. Um, so in terms of lessons learned, there's also things that need improvement as well. So also something that Bronte hit upon and um, we've talked about with a lot of people, including mm -hmm. um, the county, the delegates, et cetera, is awareness of state funding. So as was mentioned, we were not part of the first wave of funding. Um, we were not even aware of the process. So that, that was a, that's an issue. So it was later rectified, as, as was mentioned, um, both the Eastern and Western Shore um, were, were omitted, and so they had to do some things. But we, there were some counties, understand they have a higher population, but that got a lot of money in. So $20,000 was kind of like the, the participation prize, almost. Um, also, committee, um, CCC member involvement in, in events is something that's very, very critical. I always think about um, one of the days when Jesse and, um, and Lori were out. They went to two or three events, so they were out like 12, 16 hours. And so again, if you have more in involvement um, and more people that participate, you'll be able to cover more events, understanding that this was a very, very special situation too. So we had great CCC members mm -hmm. um, just in the future when we're talking about 2027 and we're talking about other things, um, whether it's with the census or something else, um, we need to make sure that we have participation. 
And the piece that I just also wanted to emphasize, especially with this group, is just accountability. So for the census, it's important to all of us, for the community, it's important in our, you know, our districts, our areas, et cetera. So the accountability Ability, excuse me, that we have there are government officials, community organizations, and you know, holding our subcommittees uh, accountable. One of the pieces that's in that um, transition report about that is, and we can say we want to hold people accountable, accountable, but people need to understand what we're, what the let's say expectations are, or communicate that beforehand. So when we talk about starting in 2027, that also includes getting people engaged. So that if you have ideas or you know this works better, and again, what worked this year, even regardless of um, COVID is not necessarily the same as what's going to be in um, 2030. So um, starting early is, is very, very key. You know that we had some, some um, challenges because of Salisbury University not being here, et cetera, with the count, but we still surpassed our 2010 count, and we know that we will do fabulous, fabulous things in 2030. <laughs> so I think that's a, Oh, I think there was a slide with pictures. Yeah. Yes. You got to see the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. And we did spare you the sense of shuffle video. I was going to ask, is there a video in here? Uh, <laughs> Lori dancing at least. We have, we have the video <laughs> somewhere, I think. Jesse has it. But um, we wanted to spare you. We know you have a long it's agenda. <laughs> it's in the archives. And we filmed that right in front here of the building. So that's what we wanted to present um, to you, just to make sure that um, you just understood how hard that everybody worked. Um, again, the partnership with um, the city and the county was is something that really, really needs to happen. That that really was um, what the success was dependent on, mm -hmm. and it started with um, actually in this room with, like you said, the county executive and, and the mayor, um, just giving the proclamations and having us move forward. So appreciate that. Thank you. And in case you didn't know, we were the lead county for the Eastern Shore, so. When we were meeting, we were the first. So they actually called us a lot for suggestions and wanted to know what we were doing. Um, so we made us look really, really good. <laughs> we did. Awesome. So yeah, we did a great awesome. job. And again, a great team of people didn't know these people in the beginning. And now they are definitely an imprint on my heart forever. They're just amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing team. Thank you guys for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hold on, hold on. Oh, don't go yet. Don't go yet. We might have a few questions from council. Okay. Okay. So, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? I had a comment. Okay. Um, there was uh, several times I had occasion to uh, sit in on some of your meetings and go to some of the events, and I was so impressed on how hard the census team was working. And I just know you guys went all out. Thank Appreciate you. it very much. Thank you. Did a great job. Did a real great job. I do have a, a just a couple, maybe one question. Um, how, what was your participation with the other municipalities uh, in the county? Did you have any representation from like Sharptown, Hebron, Mardella, yes. Willard? So you had so you had some input yes. from them. And... Yeah, Mar yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. They All were right. on members on the complete count committee. Okay. On those All areas, right. and some of them were our census champions. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Good. That's good to hear. Well, you know, it's a lot of work, and it's not something that a committee can do in a couple months. This is several years. Uh, so we appreciate your time, your commitment, uh, and, and the hard work you all put into it. And uh, um, so now it's, it's the implementation of this, not just with, you know, there's some funding things because this helps us with everything. Yes. Uh, but, you know, right now we're in the middle of doing our, our redistricting uh, mm -hmm. for, yes. for the uh, elections. So, uh, so that's, that's the next big, which this work has to be complete right. before we can get started right. on that. And mm -hmm. uh, we know this was, a lot of that work was supposed to be started earlier in the year and should be done by now. And so, but we appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. To and as long as I've been living here, I've never seen a group work so hard. Mm -hmm. um, been here all my life and you did an excellent job. I commend you even in COVID. Yeah. You took risk doing what you did. Mm -hmm. And the city thanks you for that. I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Comment? Yes, I do. Um, actually, I come bearing gifts, which oh. is not very often. <laughs> Lord, you don't care. But anyway, um, I think I would have to echo what Councilwoman Jackson said. 
in the midst of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about it, mostly it's when I'm riding past certain stops where we all were at. And I think about this time last year, mm -hmm. this time last year we were here, this time last year. And I'm grateful to God that we were able to get through that healthy. Any of us was definitely quarantined a couple of times, <laughs> um, but we came through it. And today I want to acknowledge the city of Salisbury, the council, the mayor, and Julia DeLands for your hard work and support. So I'm gonna ask the mayor if you would come, also the vice president, if you would come, as well as Julia, because we have something for you from the Maryland Department of Planning, Census Maryland. The city of Salisbury Council, in recognition, in recognition, excuse me, and celebration of your dedication to a complete count during the 2020 census, your tireless efforts to ensure resources for the next decade, your devotion to, to your community and the general commitment to Maryland's future. I am pleased to confer upon you this citation from the, gov from, excuse me, from the Maryland Department of Planning Secretary Citation, commending you on the dedication and commitment to the common goal of making Maryland communities better places to live and work. This was given on October 29th, of course we're a little late, but we're here, <laughs> 2020, just blame it on COVID, um, <laughs> 2020, but we cannot thank you enough yeah. on the behalf of Robert S. McCord, Secretary of, of Planning. Here's one for the City Council, for you to hand, hang up proudly, and of course, Mayor Day, one for you as well. And Julia, I truly enjoy working with Julia. She's a prized possession that I really enjoy. We have a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun and a lot of laughs, but it was great to be a part of this. It was great for the county and the city to be able to work on something that we could all come to agreement that we wanted to get done successfully. And I thank you, Julia, for all your help. Yeah, if I if I may before uh, before y'all leave, um, so uh, Lori will know where I'm going with my question before I even give it. Um, so uh, you know, I think there's there's no doubt that this was probably the hardest time to conduct the census uh, at any point in United States history, and um, given that, uh, it's it's pretty astounding to look at some of the, the trends um, in our area and to see that, that growth was still happening um, and that our area stood out on the Eastern Shore of Maryland in that regard. Um, but one of, the, one of the topics that's come up um, from uh, county planning is that uh, there, there are some anomalies that have been identified out there, uh, which could in theory shortchange our community. And it, it looks as if, and, and I, I don't think this is a surprise in the census world, that um, you know, communities with a higher percentage of immigrant population um, and more diverse communities get shortchanged at a disproportionate rate. Um, that it's that it's less likely that we get an accurate count than uh, a community that's you know lower in numbers of immigrants, uh, less diverse, and and wealthier communities. They get less shortchanged. Um, so. With with that, what what are our uh, Lori? What are our remedies, and and what what can we do moving forward, and how can we um, how can we correct that, or is is it even is correcting that even the path? Yes. So I did some research. I do have a document, and I do apologize for not having it with me. It's on my desk, but uh, there is a way where um, starting um, actually in a couple of weeks we can be able to fill out forms specifically to blocks that we have some concerns about. Um, and th there is a process, um, that pr process will actually be allowed for a 30 day comment once the final numbers are out. Okay, and so I have all of that, I have each of the dates, so we can be on, on top of that to make sure that 
we are getting the accurate count. Let, let us know. Thank you for that. And let us know how to help you with that. Um, that might be something that you know, the city team would be ready to assist with, you know, continue with this collaborative effort. I think um, you know, none of that should take away from the hard work that went in and uh, the incredible effort that, that was put forth. And none of that should take away from your leadership at all. Um, but I also think we know, you know, communities like ours, every census get shortchanged. And we want to we make sure we prevail. I have a question for you, Mayor Day. Oh, no. Did the governor say anything that they have said in legislation about being able to know that these numbers are a little skewed because of the pandemic and be able to make some adjustments to say, we'll still give you a certain percent more because we didn't, weren't able to get a count? It's the way it should be. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I haven't heard I haven't heard that in any official uh, messaging. Okay. Um, but but admittedly, you know, um, I, I think the time for that discussion is is now. You know, um, I don't know that it, it would have come up yet, but but now is the time. So um, we won't hesitate to to ask, and we've got an opportunity with our legislators coming up with the uh, our state. Uh, legislators uh, coming up for the, the city of Salisbury legislative lunch. Um, I think it's next month. Um, so we can certainly pose that question and, and ask them to, to consider that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay, next on our agenda is an ordinance. Uh, it's an agreement for construction and maintenance for an ADA ramp. Uh, this is by Business Development Director, Laura Sober. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you've seen, included in your packet is an agreement that would allow us to construct an ADA ramp to the rear entrance of our office. Uh, this has really been a collaborative effort with the Masonic Lodge and St. Peter's Church and it would bring much needed ADA access to our, our location. As I mentioned, that, that access would be at the rear entrance and the agreement provides us five spaces behind the old city hall building where we could dedicate parking uh, handicap spaces to folks coming in. So uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer anything anyone has. Such as to move. Great, it's much needed. Yeah. Very much, very much very so. Very much needed. <laughs> Consensus to move forward. Yes. Right. Thank you. We'll Thank place you. that on our next agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up mm -hmm. is oh, the ordinance to transfer funds for construction of an ADA lift at Poplar Hill Mansion. And Field Operations Director Jana Potvin and our curator Sarah. Happy belated birthday, Sarah. He's got for another couple weeks. Oh. Well, there was a fundraiser. <laughs> I saw that. that I, getting a head start. That I <laughs> contributed $10 to, so we might have to contribute to And I appreciate ten. that. Okay. And so does the mansion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe it'll help with the ramp. <laughs> it's, um, it's ADA night tonight um, for the work session. Um, in fiscal year 21, there was $40,000 that was allocated um, for the construction of ADA improvements in the prep in the bathroom and a ramp. Um, we were able to complete the um, bathroom improvements um, at a cost of just over $19,000, but the Maryland, Maryland Historical Trust denied our request to install a ramp. Uh, primarily for the visual impact, um, it, it had to be a U-shaped because of the rise and the run to get it level, and it just um, had to extend past the mansion, and they requested us to look at alternative solutions, and they actually recommended a lift. Um, so the budget amendment tonight would take money from surplus, $35,000, and add that to the remaining $20,000, and that would hopefully provide enough for us to complete the design of an ADA lift and construct it. Questions or comments? I, I do. I have a concern with safety. If something were to happen and you have a lift, how many people could get on a lift? One. That's what I'm saying. And suppose you have more than one person in there that is handicapped. And it would go up a second time. Yeah, but it, it suppose it's a fire or something in that building. I mean, these are the things that I'm thinking about as far as emergencies. 
Well, the problem is right now is nobody could get out if they were disabled. And, I mean, they can't even get in. I understand and, that. Yeah. I understand and that. But then you have to also think of... What? The, the lift is a, is, a, is a treatment that is allowed. It's one of those that's recommended um, for historic properties. Um, you know, the federal properties will do it and state prop historic properties. It, um, it's the option that is available to give wheelchair um, bound visitors an option to, to enter the building. Um, the other alternative that was brought up was to possibly relocate the ramp to go through the kitchen, but that is not allowed because of health department Probably, rules yeah. and also there's structural issues with that door. Um, so this is the option that's available. I've asked um, Amanda and her team to come out and look to see if there could possibly be um, another option, another routing for this ramp. And there isn't because of the elevation that it has to go. And there's also the concern of the basement underneath as well to be able to provide access to that basement. So if we as a community want to provide ADA accessibility to the mansion, this is an option that's available to us. And by Maryland Historical Trust's response letter to us, it is one that they view as in as a as a positive improvement. Yeah, I having been out there, I can tell you right now that the ramp is would have to be so long because of the height of the the where the door is located. The ramp would basically take over the yard um, in order to create the length needed to be able to get out at the at the right. You would end. lose yeah. that entire courtyard. Yeah, that, that at, entire at the front. At the back. back. At the, the back. back. At the back. Yeah. The yeah. front is off limits. Okay. Yeah. 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 MHT requires us to put the the, the yeah. ADA improvements on the rear of the house. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it's just physically impossible from what I, being over there and and measuring it out, it would just be physically impossible to do anything else. So. And, and I understand, uh, Councilwoman Jackson, that your safety concerns, but we would have the same kind of concerns even with the ramp, if you've got a person in a wheelchair it's still gonna be difficult even with the ramp to get multiple people down that ramp because of the size of the ramp would have to be because of the elevation. We're talking a five foot elevation. And because of the standards, that's gonna be a pretty long ramp and there's still gonna be issues with safety. I mean, I have full faith in our you know, Salisbury Fire Department of getting people out safely from the house if there's an emergency. Mm, I still have some questions about it, so. No. It's, it's I, don't, I don't disagree at all. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, well, I think the only option is if, if yeah. we want ADA accessibility, this, this is our only option to provide accessibility to this building, um, which is un unfortunate, um, but that's what the state is mandating. So they are, they're saying we're not allowed to have a ramp that we... We put in for a plan for a ramp and they told us flat out no for the plan that was submitted. They, they strongly urged looking into a lift. Okay. That was our local historicals? No, no that, that, that was the state. state. Yeah. Okay. They, so. they requested that we explore alternatives to the proposed ramp, such as a lift, mm -hmm. which would have less visual and physical impact on the historic resource. So they're worrying about a building, but there is, I'm, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the historical. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. You're more concerned about a building than you are people's lives. Well, as far as the Maryland Historical Trust, yes. So basically, the lift would be on the back of the building, but if we did the ramp, the ramp would have to on the back. Be on, the on the back. And you're saying that it would take up too much of that property to. It would have to be a U shape. Mm -hmm. So it would come out the door and then go mm -hmm. and then go past the, mm -hmm. the edge of the building over the whole entire courtyard, mm -hmm. almost where the kitchen is, to be able to get that. Um, uh, Michelle, so. are you. Um, is this this is the very same ramp? Did Jack meet with anybody in regards to that ramp? I it, believe Jack he took a look at it. Yeah, he, he was on site. Okay, so basically a lift is the option. Correct. Yes. That's, that's the option. To provide ADA ac mm -hmm. accessibility. If I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just unfortunate. Yeah. We we talked about both options, you know, and. And you know, I think we we went with the ramp option for a variety of reasons, but safe, safety is the obvious one. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And that's the most important thing. And it could be done in a way that was still attractive. It'd be out of scale. It'd be big, and it wouldn't be historically accurate, but it would be attractive. We could make it attractive. But clearly, that's not convincing to the people in charge. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things, too. They didn't necessarily want a ramp that was elaborate in design, either to compete with the character of the house. So, have we reached out to a Chief Tall and our fire inspector to provide an opinion and submit back to the Maryland Historical Trust? No. I don't know that. I mean, I mean MHT is filled with architects and yeah. not going to be convinced by mm -mm, uh, a local, you know, <laughs> They have standards for yeah. the treatment of historical properties that they have to follow, and they are saying this is in, the ramp is inconsistent with those standards because of its size, its, its <laughs> breadth, <laughs> right. is, you know, is the, bathroom, the massiveness of it. it. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Is the um, bathroom at Popular Hill Mansion, is that ADA accessible? It has been made yes. that way. It has been made that way, okay. So they're just coming up through the back, yes. not in the kitchen door, but. No. Correct. Okay. Well, I mean, you have to have something. We gotta have something. I mean, it's, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And it sounds like a pretty big t price tag, too. But So if there's not any further discussion, do we have consensus to move forward with this ordinance? Yes. April? Mm -mm. No? We have three yeses, so we'll put this on Monday's agenda. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up is Meadow... Cultivation Code Amendment, Housing and Community Development Director, Ron Strickler. Oh, with Alyssa Hastings. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good this is my afternoon. first time joining you in this room. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That yeah. is right. Wow. He was hired via Zoom, right? A lot of Zooms yeah. And yeah, that's right. Room next door. So, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so what we're bringing in front of you, the packet of information you have is directly related to allowing meadows with, within the city of Salisbury. I will tell you uh, initially, maybe seven, eight months ago when this was brought up, uh, it was to bring the code enforcement team into uh, the circle and get some information regarding how enforcement would take place. And there were concerns from code enforcement, uh, because we know if grass gets seven and three quarters inches high, we receive phone calls and we respond to them. Um, after Alyssa presented some information to the group and we were able to share with code enforcement officers, uh, we feel that the benefits uh, far outweigh any concerns of enforcement. Um, so essentially this would allow city residents to cultivate meadows. If you look through the packet of information, you can see what the definition of a meadow is what can exist in there. Um, it will require some um, some training on the part of our staff. Uh, but how do we get out in front of this? And the solution to getting out in front of this was to have the registration process for residents. Um, so then if anybody had questions or concerns or complaints, they could take a look at the website and be able to identify that this is a allowable meadow. Um, through the process, we looked at setback requirements, had some detailed discussions about that, um, ultimately went with what you see in the packet, which is 10 feet in the front, five in the sides, unless there is a fence that is not opaque. So that's pretty much sums up uh, the meadow. If you all have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them for you. Mr. Chair, I'd like to just share that uh, this idea of uh, Meadow uh, was my brainchild. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, Alyssa's here to answer any environmental questions, but I think, um, you know, we are a bee, tree, and bird city now. Um, it, you know, we know that meadows make sense. We know that we need more um, pollinators in uh, the world uh, as, as we're, there's some challenges uh, towards them. So this just makes sense as long as they're, they're well-maintained um, and uh, native, so. Yeah, I'll just jump in also and say that I wanna clarify any, any confusion about the meadows before because um, the meadows are not 
it's not just letting your grass grow and that becomes a meadow. So I think that's that was some of the initial concern from some of the code enforcement officers, like, oh, are we gonna have a lot of people just saying their grass is now a meadow and, and not maintaining their yards? Um, no, that's not a meadow. There, If you look in the legislation, we provided some very specific details about how a meadow is going to be constructed. And the power really is in the city here where we can determine whether something is allowed or not. They have to register with um, with HCDD, and we're not going to allow for unsightly um, conditions to occur. Any questions or comments? Didn't we have a discussion about this some years ago, a couple of years ago? I'm pretty sure we did. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we did. Relatively I new. I, I think it was more along the lines of with the bee pollinating. <laughs> No, we but, were talking, you talking about, about a separate. We were, we we're talking about code, code enforcement, and how to maintain your your lawn, uh, yeah, your yard, or whatever. I think, and we had some difficulty with this before. I do remember that somewhat. It's been like maybe two or three years ago. Yeah. It's been a. It's been well, because I know when. Because as soon as I read yeah. it, I started. It started. Some things started coming back to me. Because, but like she said, it's specific though. It's not yeah. like when. We lived on West Road outside of town. We had a neighbor that uh, refused to cut their grass, <laughs> and it was just unsightly grass. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't specific things planted or put in place to attract bees for pollination. This was, this was just somebody who didn't want to cut their grass, mm -hmm. but, and which is what we want to avoid, mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. It, Two things, you know, I think this this kind of gets us down a road of, of asking ourselves, you know, what's the, what's the um, I know we don't have water shortages around here, but what's the sustainable uh, solution? You know, um, you know, I think a lot of us put, uh, you know, a lot of resources into our, our lawns and it's not always the best for the environment. Um, and meadows potentially require less from the way of watering fertilizing right um, so that it's good in that regard but but I mean potentially this could even go further at some point um, you know alternative landscapes to the you know the traditional grass lawn in single-family houses um, you know a couple years ago we had a code enforcement issue this and maybe this is when it came up we had a code enforcement issue where one landlord went around and replaced all their lawns with um, like red stone the like gravel? Uh, yeah. I think that's what it was. <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> and, and in hindsight, was. Uh, uh, there, there, was a, there was a concern, and they all got written up and removed. But, uh, but in hindsight, you know, that may be an option in the future uh, or, or, you know, alternatives to, you know, the traditional monoculture uh, uh, turf grass lawn. Uh, so maybe it's one step in that direction. I will also say there's a couple of folks in my neighborhood who have taken the strip between the street and the sidewalk and started to do different things with that. Um, some cases planting sunflowers, various things, and it's no longer grass, yeah. um, but, it, but it looks nice. It's, it's different. Uh, mm -hmm. It takes some getting used to, but it's, it still looks nice. We really just want to open up the possibility for folks in the city to do these things because right now it's not allowed in our code. And so we're not saying that you ha that you have to do this or that you necessarily should, but some people who want to, we don't want them to we don't want to make it a violation to have a yard that's sustainable for the environment. That's basically the bottom line. And I, I don't I don't know this to to be to be true, but I I wouldn't foresee a property owner having a meadow in their entire on their entire property i think it would be a section and when i think about this from a water protection standpoint you know that was really important to me uh, the filtration that this provides and we know we have many of our properties in the city that run off into our waterways which i use quite a bit and i'm sure many people in the community do as well um, so it would definitely support that as well any further questions comments all right we have consensus to move forward mm -hmm. yes all right we'll place this on monday's agenda Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up is, res is a resolution for a connection fee waiver for 117 to 119 West Main Street, Department of Infrastructure. Amanda Pollock. 
How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get into it. So this is a connection fee waiver request for 117, 119 West Main Street. Mm -hmm. And the proposed use is a restaurant and distillery. And this is down on awesome. the, the old plaza. So the request is for 28 equivalent dwelling units. And at the current comprehensive connection charge rate, the waiver request is equivalent to $103,880. And if you recall, we modified the criteria for these types of waivers last year um, in Ordinance 2611. And now there needs to be some public benefit to the projects to be able to receive this type of a waiver. And for this project, the public benefit will include um, funding of $5,000 towards new street lights along St. Peter Street, as well as funding a bike rack in that area. So we did feel like that was adequate public benefit to be able to receive this connection charge waiver. They also have met all the other criteria. Um, this is not eligible for affordable housing. It is in the central business district and it's, it's met the other necessary criteria. So a distillery doesn't count as a uh, public benefit? <laughs> oh, okay. Any questions or comments? No. We have consensus yes. to move this forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Yeah, we're very appreciative for the lights and the mm -hmm. bike, the bike rack. So, you have consensus that'll be on Monday's agenda. Yes. Yep. All right. Next up is an ordinance for assessment on transportation network service companies. I'm bringing Will White up, who's our transportation project specialist, and he actually found this, uh, that the Maryland General Assembly passed a law back in 2015 allowing municipalities and counties to charge an assessment per ride from transportation network companies such as Ubers or Lyfts. So we have the ability to charge 25 cents per ride that's um, generated from the city of Salisbury. And if you think about how these companies work, they're, they're driving around waiting for people to transport. So they are utilizing the city streets more than a regular vehicle because they're, they're driving around and driving around waiting to, to pick someone up. So there is a process for us to follow if we are interested in collecting this assessment. It's essentially um, free money out there for us. It's an untapped revenue source. So far there's seven jurisdictions in the state that have um, you know, enacted this, and we would like to be one of those those jurisdictions. So there is an ordinance for your consideration, as well as specific letters we have to notify both Wicomico County that we're interested in doing this, as well as the Maryland Comptroller's Office. Anything you want to add? Okay. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I have one question. Um, would this be like the taxi rides, or just Uber, or Lift or what it would be all of that it's specifically a transportation network service company which is an uber or a lyft um it does not hit taxis that are regulated under like the maryland taxi commission etc do taxis pay anything to the city not anything more as of right now they do not that i know of. okay um personally i will not support this unless you know but i'm not really generally supportive of a new tax so um, but I'll let other council members uh, weigh in on that. Have you talked to uh, any anybody who this may impact? Any local Uber drivers or Lyft people or any anybody in the companies? No, so we have no idea of knowing who those people are. Mm -hmm. um, the apps purposely uh, mm -hmm. anonymize them. So the Uber and Lyft are, just have to comply. We don't even know what they're ride data is we don't know how many are in the city because they can't they don't provide that to us right and we have no way to force them to one of the other advantages of this is it will at least know how many rides are in the city because they have to provide ride data to us with as far as number of rides with the cost data how much they're paying us through the comptroller comptroller's office so it's 25 cent per ride yes that originates or ends originates in the city of salisbury so why aren't we charging taxi cabs there's no authority for us to do so. Mm -hmm. None. Not that I, there, there may be a way because Ocean City does, but there's no way under our code that allows us to do it. So why are we doing this to the Ubers and the Lyfts? If I may. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we can, it, do, it is not in our code, but we could. Okay. And in fact, um, Wicomico County takes a very hands-off approach mm -hmm. to uh, taxis, but 
let's be honest, most of them originate or end in Salisbury. Um, so we could do that as well. It would be a separate process, but we could do that as well. We could consider that. We've looked at it in years past. Um, so I think at one point we had uh, tasked Mr. Tillman with writing something up. So we might have like a memo about it. Um, so answering that question. And then I, if I can, uh, I would just add, um, you know, I personally, I, I am all in favor of these fees being applied to these companies and taxi companies too. Um, 25 cents as a person who has used both Uber and Lyft uh, in our city, um, you know, I, I think 25 cents is something I'd be more than happy to pay, mm -hmm. um, knowing that it goes to compensate the municipalities whose roads are getting tear, torn up um, by, uh, by these companies. Any does other? this come out of the company bottom line, or does this come out of the driver? Neither. It comes from you, the user. Oh, the, the user. The user end. Okay. Further questions or comments? We have consensus to move forward? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we can move it forward. Okay. Looks like you have a three to one on moving it forward. So it'll be on Monday's <laughs> agenda. Just to add, I, I, I would suggest then, if that's how it's going to go, that we look at being fair to all, uh, including taxi cabs. Right. Totally agree. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Next up is a budget amendment for the city park bandstand and bridge improvements. So we have an endowment fund at the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore to fund improvements to the historic bridge and bandstand in the city park. But we have to treat that like a grant. So we need to do a budget amendment to get those funds to be able to utilize that endowment fund. So we have worked with field operations and we have a scope of work of repairs that need to get done at both the bandstand and the bridge. We've also contacted the community foundation and you have their letter in your package that we have uh, just over $40,000 available right now through the endowment fund. Um, based on the repairs that we need to do, we thought it was just a little bit more than that, about 42 or 43,000. So we're looking to take an additional $5,000 from surplus for contingency and to cover what we think that overage will be. So this is a budget amendment for $45,000 of which 40,000 is from the endowment fund. But we have to do the budget amendment first, spend the money and then seek reimbursement from the community foundation. Um, we also met with the um, community band that, that performs in the summer to get their wish list of things at the bandstand mm -hmm. as well. So we're, we're trying to address uh, you know, comprehensively all the repairs that need to get done both at the bandstand and the bridge at the same time. Any questions or comments from the council? Well, this is an awful lot from surplus, but I, I mean, I understand about the repairs. We just did a, um, a surplus request for the lift too, right? So this is only going to be 5,000 from surplus and then the other 40 will get reimbursed first. from the community foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Both are iconic symbols of our city park and our mm -hmm. city. So, um, and when is the last time they've had any kind of, um, he did some improvements on the bridge in 2017. Yeah. We painted it. So it needs some new railing. Yeah, nice. we, we go out and, and kind of poke in the railing and see which members are rotten. And then the bandstand, we've just done some minor repairs. So this is, uh, the last time we've just done paint. So this is more major improvements to the railing as well. And it's, it's been a while. I think they did something, uh, five or six years ago. Didn't they put something up on the top of the bandstand? Was it like plexiglass or something that they know? No plexiglass there, but the uh, or maybe they talked. There's about a couple it. of railing pieces. Yeah. Um, there's some there's some railing pieces on one side that are s slightly different. There's some panels of the railing that are different than others because I think they had some different some times. rot. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple spots where there's yeah. just soft wood. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's some rot right now. Okay. Yeah. So we have consensus to move forward. Yes, we do. This will be on Monday's agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Next up is ordinance uh, for a budget amendment for a special assistant for intergovernmental affairs position. City Administrator Julia Glanz. 
Yeah, Good board. evening, Council. Uh, as mentioned before you is a budget amendment to add a position to uh, the administrative office, a special assistant for intergovernmental intergovern affairs. So uh, since 2017, we've been trying to build the best structure possible to, to lead uh, the city, to lead our, our departments. Um, and there have been some tweaks here and there to, to get the best um, you know structure for us. Um, and I think we've done a really good job over the last five years in building a team. Um, we have realized um, probably since 2018 that there is a gap um, in our structure that deals with high level um, policy development, um, project management, uh, government affairs, lobbying efforts at the state and federal levels. Um, so before you is a, is a new position that would um, manage all of those tasks. Um, and we believe that uh, you'll uh, immediately start to see the benefits that uh, of, of, of new legislation coming before you, um, efforts uh, to advocate for, for federal dollars. Um, so I think the, the mayor has some items to add uh, on this topic, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so recognizing we've been through, going through this process since 2017 of trying to, to figure out what that structure looks like. Um, I think uh, you mentioned in the memo, the first step was recognizing a communications weakness. And so we created the media and uh, special events, uh, or media and events specialist, Becca. Um, and then, uh, you know, this, this shortcoming was the other recognition. So it was, um, did we want a special position to focus on that at the time? Um, and, and or did we want to create the media and events position? We went with the media and events position, but, but here we are. And so, um, uh, what what we noticed was uh, we had an immediate opportunity um, to find a person to fill that role because we had a vacancy in the grants position. Um, and in our community, we were able to talk to many other organizations that were recruiting for grants uh, writers, grant specialists, grant managers, and um, there were no candidates that were that stood out. Um, so we figured we would have a vacancy for some time in that role. Uh, so we we uh, we shared this information with the council president and just uh, you know that we had a plan to move forward. Uh, that plan was to uh, fill that position temporarily with um, uh, fill the grant position temporarily with the incumbent for this position, um, and you know we can share his name. I think uh, Nate Sansom. He's he's already in the job. Um, and then recognizing it would take us some time, uh, months more, to find a person to fill the grants position. But we have. Uh, so we now have the person to fill the grants position. Um, so uh, this position that's being uh, presented tonight is filled currently. Um, but we need to do the budget amendment in order to hire the person for the grants position. Um, in the meantime, however, we have found that the special assistant for intergovernmental affairs uh, can and should spend a lot of their time working on bringing in money to the city. And so that's what, uh, that's one of the things that Mr. Sansom has done, uh, has been working on federal and state grants as well as private, one will announce later this week, um, and uh, a very large uh, federal grant that we're working on as well. Uh, so uh, I think it's, uh, it's a position that has you know, paid for itself in, in spades in a number of months, uh, weeks even, uh, but it doesn't end there. Because uh, the reality is our, our bigger weakness, I think, has been in communicating with our state legislators and state agencies, and um, that's a gap that Nate is quickly filling. Um, now, uh, admittedly, we don't have Nate forever. Uh, you know, we, we recognize that he's got other opportunities, um, but we think the job is critical um, and the position is critical. And so that's why we're here tonight. Well, I have a question. Okay. When we were going through our budget, <laughs> why, why not present this at that time, this additional position. We were talking about a lot of positions at the time when we were going through budget. And now we're in, was it, uh, um, well, September. And we have another whole position. Correct? Or my question I can't, is- I can't speak to that, I wasn't here. Yeah, I'm just, because we're, but now we have this, the incumbent 
You know, yeah. We have the candidate, we have the incumbent mm -hmm. in the position. We have, the work is getting done. It's proving to be effective for our city. Uh, and so regardless of what the past held, the present and the future, mm -hmm. um, you know, call for our city to be. So somebody, so somebody's in the position before we actually were able to fund or fund it. I'm confused. I think I'm confused. What I just anything. explained. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so we, we, what I just had, we didn't have uh, somebody in the grants position because that had been open for a while. Nate, okay. Nate filled that position, but he had been doing other duties. Uh, and th this was something that was discussed a couple years ago um, as we were like, like I think Julia said, when we were part of the reorganization process. Mm -hmm. um, every, every year. It's, yeah, been, it's come up. And but I think what happened was is we were struggling to fill one position, but now we have the person for the position we want to create and somebody to fill that position that he's currently in, which is a grants position. So that was the issue. And it mm -hmm. proved, like he said, with the work that he's doing, that, that it's mm -hmm. going to pay for itself. Correct, and, and as, as Nate was um, hired in the grants position uh, in June, um, he was managing some grant responsibilities strictly, um, along with some of these policy level um, uh, processes as well. Um, and so now that we, we have a, f a full time person that we've made an offer to for the grants position that can do uh, both grant writing and the administrative piece. Um, you know, he can focus solely on on the things outlined in the memo, which also uh, include going after federal dollars and state dollars that a grants person uh, would would not be in their portfolio por portfolio normally. I would also add that Nate has provided the city with years of volunteer work as an intern, even when he was studying abroad, <laughs> he was still doing work for the city for free. <laughs> so he, talking about the right person for a job who has written much of the legislation we've passed over the, the past few years. Uh, so I, absolutely he's the right person. Uh, Including some of what's before you tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, but any other questions or comments on this issue? We have consensus to move forward? Yes. Yes. All right. So we will place this on Monday's agenda. All right. At this time, administration and council remarks, and so that I do not forget to have the administration make remarks, I will ask them to go first. <laughs> There's no hard feelings or anything. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm uh, good. Yeah, if I can. Um, so we, we've talked about it a couple of times. Um, I've used this moment um, at the end of council meetings or work sessions to talk about it. Um, I just want to reiterate that um, you know we're, we're constantly reaching. Uh, new stress points in our community when it comes to housing. And um, I'm very concerned about it. And so I want to make sure that, that you know uh, I'm feeling that stress. Our staff is feeling that stress. Our community is feeling that stress. This, this Saturday night uh, at the zoo at 5 p.m. is another project opportunity. Uh, project opportunity Community event, project. opportunity project event. Uh, Greater Salisbury Committee, Chamber of Commerce, SU, Purdue, uh, Title Health, uh, where they're bringing their new employees who have come to our community and moved here out to a, a welcoming event, basically. You know, hey, welcome to Salisbury. But the thing we heard overwhelmingly the first time was how hard it is to get housing in Salisbury. <clears throat> so um, uh, we are... Um, I, I will be in direct communication with each of you on um, thoughts on a path forward um, this week. So I know we've been talking about it for a while, but we're there. Um, so we got to do something uh, or else I think we'll, uh, we'll get a wash by the eviction crisis. Um, what is already an affordability crisis, uh, what is no doubt um, a supply and demand mismatch. Um, so expect that. Um, and uh, I think the, the second thing I would say is that um, in the coming weeks, we'll be following up with you. Uh, I'll be following up with you about um, the early 2020 um, 
uh, police trust rebuilding initiative, that nine point uh, plan, which uh, had a number of effects, including creating the criminal justice reform task force, um, you know, uh, had a series of other recommendations. Well, there, uh, many of them are ready for implementation now as well. Um, so uh, the work of that task force is not done. They still have some things that they're doing, but there will be a lot that we need uh, uh, beyond the work of the task force that needs to be implemented. So I'll be back to you very soon on that. Thank you. Ms. Glanz, anything? No? Okay. Uh, we'll start down there with Mrs. Gregory. Just want to reiterate, you know, please continue to, to get vaccinated. Um, you know, our, our positivity rate is over 11% still, um, which is almost three times the state rate. So please go get vaccinated. It, it will save your life. Um, you know, this is, this is something that is affecting your friends and neighbors who are immune compromised, if you don't get vaccinated and they can't, they have no protection. So please, please, please go get va uh, vaccinated. Jackson. I'm lost for words. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> I really am. Everybody have a great evening. Is that the Be harvest blessed. moon tonight coming out? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Watch it, watch it, Angela, watch it. I had you laughing enough. You don't want me heavy laughing. No, no I know that's true. That's no, true. but um, just everybody, oh. as um, Michelle said, get vaccinated, please. It's for your own good. That's all I have to say. Okay. Um, school is back. We've got these big yellow vehicles on the roads. Please be safe. Um, and also watch the crosswalks. I've noticed a lot of um, traffic that's a little bit fast and not really paying attention. And you've got, you've got to stop and look. Um, and if you're healthy enough, please donate blood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to reiterate what Michelle and, and, and April said, uh, please, uh, please get vaccinated. Uh, this weekend, our family lost a very close uh, friend of ours uh, to COVID. Uh, he was probably about 35 years old, healthy, hard worker, uh, left behind a wife uh, and daughter and had it, wasn't feeling good went to work, possibly gave it to other people. And the, he was, he had the Delta variant and he, as soon as he knew that he had it, he was dead within three days. Uh, refused to go to the hospital, refused to get vaccinated and he died. So uh, I, I think, uh, you know, getting the vaccine might not prevent you from getting COVID, but it will prevent the effect that it can have on you and it can make the it, it can make it less than not getting vaccinated just like polio you get the polio vaccine you can still get polio you might get a few bumps but if you don't get the vaccine and you got polio it's a lot worse hey, uh, I, so can sure. i say one more thing you don't even know what's in your food today for real mm -hmm. so stop questioning what's in the covid vaccine when the food we eat every day, you do not know what's in it. So, I mean, we've been getting vaccinated. You get your blood drawn, you get flu shots. You don't know what's in it. You don't know if they're sticking a needle in your arm to draw your blood or they're not sticking something else in you. You just don't know. Do be mindful. This is, a, this is very serious. I'm telling you, I've lost a lot of family members and a lot of friends behind this. Almost lost my own life. Serious. This is serious. You don't want it. I'm telling anybody that hasn't gotten their vaccine, you do not want COVID. With that, I'm yes, I'm sorry. I, I forgot one big category. And, um, you know, I do want to just say here, here to that message. That's important. Um, but National Folk Festival, um, uh, we, we've got, you know, some numbers that I think are worth sharing. Uh, so, um, uh, festival, uh, we, the survey went out to uh, downtown uh, businesses 
uh, in and around the footprint. Uh, had about 84% um, say that uh, they, it met or exceeded their expectations uh, for the weekend, which is always good. I think a big part of that, we, I think we agree that a big part of that is um, a lot of them worked really hard for that. Um, you know, they came up with the ways to make it successful for themselves. Um, and I think in the first year, uh, you know, people sat back and just thought uh, the money was going to roll in, um, you know, and it's evolved. But now, uh, you know, people are out there selling some selling stuff right on the street, and they're they're doing great. Um, uh, estimated attendance was ninety one thousand, which is in between the first and second, um, you know, with a smaller footprint and with less time advertising, and with COVID, not terribly surprising that it mm -hmm. didn't meet the year two numbers. Um, but uh, you know, I don't I don't look at that as disappointing. Um, Almost 600 volunteers uh, who gave 1,460 hours, uh, over $26,000 in the Bucket Brigade, uh, collected by the buck Bucket Brigade, which is awesome. Um, over 65,000 in beer and merchandise sold. Um, trash collected, 3.6 tons of trash collected. Um, and uh, as far as recycling, 0.2 tons of cardboard, um, almost 0.4 tons of plastic and aluminum collected, 7,570 gallons of water dispensed through the water stations, which saved 60,560 water bottles from going uh, into the landfill just, just at this one event. And then it, right. 24 hours of uh, radio broadcast, live radio broadcast. So. Pretty, pretty cool. How much did the Bucket Brigade bring in? $26,618. Wow, so good. in between first I'm and second. around yeah. with a bucket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were hustling. We were hustling. Oh, yeah, hustling. you did great. Believe it. I'll have it. <laughs> That's pretty good. We awesome. did good. I, when I looked at 91,000 um, participants for mm -hmm. COVID and for a smaller yes. footprint, I thought that Not was bad. pretty amazing. Not mm -hmm. bad. That's awesome. Not bad. Good for souls. Yeah. But yeah, I, I did like the idea of having, le allowing the restaurants to move out on the sidewalk like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I would say that might be a good formula for our weekends. I don't have a problem yeah. with it, but, you know, or even, even third Friday. So awesome. Yeah. All right. So if there's not anything else, uh, wish everybody a good week. And we'll be back next Monday at 6 p.m. We're adjourned. <laughs>